tell you, wow, it is really tedious to go through this 12-page order form. Right. right. And so that's where the innovation comes in. That's where the invention goes in, comes in. When you take listening to your customers' problems in their own voices, yeah. and then no, using what you know about technology to invent something they never would have even imagined. This episode is sponsored by Bamboo Learning, co-founded by ex-Amazonian Ian Freed. Bamboo Learning is the first and only comprehensive learning solution for kids age 5 to 11 to use on Alexa. Bamboo Learning covers listening comprehension, spelling, grammar, math, and more. To try it, say, Alexa, open Bamboo Learning. Hi, I'm Dave Chappelle, and I'd like to welcome you to the Invent Like an Owner podcast where I talk with the Amazonians who helped build Amazon.com into one of the world's most valuable companies. This weekly podcast is for entrepreneurs and business leaders. Uh, The goal of the podcast is to capture the Amazon creation stories and create a historical archive. On that note, my guests are recalling history as best they can. It's possible some of the details are fuzzy or just plain wrong. If that happens, it's not intentional, and I invite future guests or commenters on the website to help us get the facts as straight as they can be. Now, on with the show. Today, I'm excited, really excited, to be talking with Mariam Mohit, who started at Amazon in June 1996 as the site producer or VP site development. She'll tell us which title came first. She was tasked with, quote, making the website interactive, unquote. And that came from Jeff. Um, And boy, did she and her team ever do that. She ended up with a team of more than 200 front end engineers, web developers, designers, editors, and researchers. And she and her team left an indelible stamp on the Amazon experience that lasted well beyond when she left in 2003. Uh, When you look up Amazonian in the virtual dictionary, you'll see Miriam. Hi there, Miriam. Hey, Dave. Um, So uh, this is going to be a really fun interview, and I know that because Miriam and I spoke uh, a few days ago, and she has a treasure trove of... uh, artifacts, if you will. She kept everything. I, I'd, I'd be afraid to see her attic. Um, so before we dive into all that, I'd love, Mary, just give us the story about how you got to Amazon. It was very early, so it's sort of, uh, I think it's a good place to start. Yeah, so I, um, well, before I came to Amazon, my first job out of college was at Random House, the book publisher in New York, in the editorial department. And so I knew a lot about the book business and a lot of the frustrations with the book business. So I fast forward a bit. Um, I had gone to work at a CD-ROM publishing company. I was a producer at a CD-ROM publishing company. That's before the web was a thing that, you know, was a commercial thing people could use. And um, I had gone on to another software company after that, two startups. And I ended up living in Seattle. So there I was living in Seattle. It the beginning of 1996, and I was at that time working for a company that was an Israeli software company based in Tel Aviv, and I was going back and forth between Tel Aviv, New York, the West Coast. It was really um, grueling. Little did I know what was to come later with Amazon, but um, I was sitting there in Seattle, and everyone had been telling me, you know, you should really start your own business. You should start your own business, and so I had two ideas for businesses that I wanted to start. One was an electronic greeting cards company, and the other was an electronic bookstore. Uh, The browser had recently come out. I was really frustrated with um, some of the limitations of shrink wrap software because, you know, you'd work really hard, you'd create the CD, you'd send it off to get pressed, and it would go off into the world, and then the minute it shipped, you would find some bug. And furthermore, there was no way for you to know how it was landing with your users. There was no way to get feedback from the people who used it and then incorporate that into making the product even better. And I found that really frustrating. I, I would be on all these panels to do with interactive media and I, would, I felt like such a fraud because I felt like this media is not interactive. And then when I first saw the first web browser, I was like, wow, this is an interactive medium. So there I was sitting in Seattle in my kitchen writing a business plan for opening an online bookstore. And then in the same week, three people who didn't know each other, but three people I knew all wrote to me and they said, hey, you're thinking about starting an online bookstore. Uh, There's this guy named Jeff who just launched an online bookstore in Seattle. You should go talk to him. So I said, okay, that sounds great. And I sent him an email and I said, hey, you just launched an online bookstore. I want to launch an online bookstore. Let's chat. So 
I went down there to um, to meet with him, and you know, he the first basically the first thing he said to me was, "Can you help make this site interactive?" And I was like, "Yeah, I can totally help make the site interactive because I had been doing CD-ROM stuff. I had been doing other kind of uh, children's educational software before that." And actually, the interview was really interesting because. I had been in two software. I had been in two software startups before Amazon, and when I met Jeff, and I just, you know, he was so analytical. He was so smart. Um, he had just such a great sense about him. I thought to myself, "Wow, this guy is this guy is the real deal. He is the real deal." And I remember him showing me, you know, very confidentially his plan to go public. So this is in you know June of 1996. This is planned to go public, and I remember saying to him, "Why would you want to do that? Like, what a hassle, you know? Then like there's going to be all these people breathing down your neck. I mean, I was so not business oriented, right. but I'm really excited about the idea of using technology to kind of be subversive. So at the time. Um, Everyone was talking about the demise of the book and how technology was going to mean that nobody ever read a book again. And I just loved the idea of using technology to help more people read more books. Right, and, and, be- and, and better books. And more of the books I want. I mean, that was yeah. one of the things I had learned from being in the book business was that there was such a... The, there was no way really for a book to find its audience. You would publish a novel, a wonderful novel. You knew that there were like 30,000 people in the US who would love that novel. And there was no way for that right. novel to find its people or the people to find the novel. So it seemed like the internet was just this amazing technology to, to kind of um, bring books and people together. And yeah, so that's right. basically how I joined. So you were you were hired. In, I know you told me you were hired in June, but you didn't start until October. So like you were. That's six, right. Yeah, and yeah. So you go ahead. No, I was going to say I answer that, and then maybe just talk about what was your first thing you were tasked with. Like probably, I know we're going to sort of cover a bunch of big launches from when yeah. you started until uh, maybe V five in late ninety eight. But like so, so how, you know, how were you brought in, and and then. What were you tasked with right out of the gate? Yeah, so when I interviewed and was offered the job in June, there were 25 people in the company. And um, right after I was given the offer, I found out that my father had cancer. And so I said, hey, you know, I would love to take this job, but I need to help my father through this surgery and recovery and et cetera. And so... um, yeah, I ended up starting in October. And by the way, right. my father is fine. He's 88 years old. And going strong, so it all worked out. But um, so when I started in October, and basically I wasn't really tasked with anything. I was tasked with looking at the website and figuring out what to do. Right. So um, it was sort of a blank slate. Now, the website at the time, we'll call it V1. It was HTML 1.0, blue, black type, white background, blue links. There was no um, navigation. There was no... Search was not on the home page. I know you did an interview with Ruben Ortega and Dwayne Bowman, two of our early wonderful engineers, and they talked about the issues with search at that time, that search results were alphabetical, um, and you know you had to fill in multiple different boxes to kind of form your query. So search was sort of behind the main page. And so what I first did, and I, oh, and I should say at that time, who was the team? We obviously had the core engineering team, and then we had one web developer, one HTML developer, whose name was Chris Mealy. Uh, we called him Mookie. And um, I think the first hire I made was our first QA tester, Miles Lane, and his job was to pound on the site and find bugs so that we could fix them. So, uh, and then we had a, a very small editorial team who, who would, would review books and write the text for the homepage, and Susan Benson was the head of that. And so um, so the first thing that um, we did was we went out and talked to customers. We looked at our, at our customer service queues. We looked at what people were telling us. We talked to customers. We you know, write to them, call them up to understand what were the problems that they were having with the website. And was, and that, so, was that formal surveys, or were you literally just having open-ended you know, uh, questions for them about, you know, issues they may be having or that sort of thing? 
So this is the this is what the website looked like V1. Uh, that's great. We'll need to get a that. copy of that for the uh, for the your blog page. Yeah. So you know we say announcing forty percent off the Amazon five hundred um, spotlight November third. Every day we would have a new book that was being spotlighted. This was the psychology of influence, which is kind of hilarious considering that it's Amazon. Um, uh, books reviewed in the New York Times Book Reviewed. It's National Humor Month. A first look at Grisham's The Partner. So there was sort of like an, almost like a newsletter. Uh, right. But, but, there was, but if you were going to the site and you were like, oh, I know what I want. I need a book about how to get my child to sleep through the night. Like there was no really easy way for you to find that. Right. And so the first thing we did was to add some navigation, just really a simple side navigation bar to help people find the different parts of the site yep. and to begin to, to, to um, be able to find the things that they were looking for. And part of, so the reason that, part of the reason search wasn't on the homepage at that time is because it probably wasn't that great, right? So it was, you know, yeah, yeah I mean, it did get added and you'll, you'll talk to that, but that was one of the issues like, that we talked about with Dwayne and Ruben. Right, exactly, because the search results were alphabetical. So if you were looking for, I think one of the examples they used was uh, John Grisham's The Partner, you know, you might find 25, 30 books. Right. You know, um, a partner of this, a partner of that, you know, before you found the book that you were actually looking for. And um, you mentioned one other thing, that the checkout process was, why was the checkout process like 12 pages? I, I get why it could be, but was it just also elementary or were they people worried and having to allay people's concerns every step of the way? Like, why, did, why yes. was it so delayed? Yeah, so the checkout process really was 12 pages. And well, first you, had a, a, first you had a screen where you had to choose whether you wanted to go to the secure server or not. Right. So that was the first thing you had to do. And then you had each step was separate. Um, you know, and I mean, right now where there's a single page for checkout at Amazon, yeah. going from that 12 pages to that single page, that actually was much later. Yeah. But we were, we were holding people's hands. I mean, at that time we still took checks, right? Because people were very afraid of putting their credit card on the internet. Yeah, so basically for listeners, people could check out the entire pipeline. They could indicate that I'm going to pay by check and I'm going to mail the check in. Then they, I guess we would email them or it would appear on the screen the instructions on where to send their check and how much to make they it out for. Exactly. Yeah. They send their check and then once we got the check, we would send them the book. And we, you know, we could say at that time, I don't remember whether we could actually say at that time when the books were going to leave the warehouse. Like we right. had very little ability to tell you well, we certainly could not tell you when the books were going to arrive on your doorstep. Right. I don't think we could even tell you when they were going to leave the warehouse. We would yeah. just take the order. So, um, and each step of the way we had text explaining how everything worked and all of this because no one had ever done this before. No one knew what it was like to buy something online. It was like and, a new concept. And so at the time, was Barnes & Noble, were they online or were they just the big scary, you know, they were, they were the boogeyman. They, they launched right around them, and we used to study their site. We looked, used to look at what they were doing. They were huge compared to us. We thought, right. oh, my God, how will we ever catch up with Barnes & Noble? Um, later on in V3 of the site where we launched a really robust browse hierarchy, that was in part to compete with Barnes & Noble because they had browsing by category, and right. we really didn't. So let so. Leaving V1, so V1, that was the basic website. Uh, there was no navigation. And maybe what you were even showing me right there was V2, but I know V2 launched sometime in 1996. Can you talk about some of the things? Was it basically just adding search to the homepage and uh, you know a few other things? Or uh, so V2 was, actually in V2, search wasn't even on the homepage yet. Okay. That came, that came later. So V2 had a left-hand rail navigation. That was the main thing that we changed in V2. And it also had a visual design. So some of the things that we had in this navigation were at the top we had, well, first of all, we had text only. As Alex Edelman mentioned in your interview, we had a text only site. That, and then we had search by author, title, subject, keyword, ISBN, and then advanced search query where you could basically create your own Boolean search terms. Search Can query. you show that image again just on the screen? It's just, it's. 
Yeah, so it is much more visually appealing already. Like you can see the layout and the yeah. boxes, that sort of stuff. Right, you can see there's a co the cover image here and it has a pricing sticker on it, 40% off. Yeah. So we had to apply those pricing stickers to the images and it had this visual design that organized things. It also had, it also had promotions, right? Um, lowest everyday prices, save up to 40%, largest selection, you know, and it shows the bar graph with how much selection we have compared to the largest superstore chain. I like that. that. That's pretty that aggressive. Gained, yeah. Right? Yeah. Very aggressive. Very aggressive from For me. a company that says they never focus on competitors, that's a pretty, uh, it's, a, it's a customer promise, but it's a competitor message. Uh, in, uh, and so tell me the story. You said that, uh, I, I remember you talking about you had a memo, maybe it was pre-launch with all of Jeff's notes on customer feedback yeah. around that launch. Find, hold on, I'm going to get that. Sure. Somewhere in there, right around that time, we were saying, okay, we're going to redesign the site. And, and we set out goals for the redesign. And one, you know, some of our goals were communicate that Amazon has vast selection, good prices, it's trustworthy. That was a really big thing, being trustworthy, right? Yeah. How do I know that I can like, give you my credit card and these books are actually going to show up on my doorstep? That was a big leap. Um, that Amazon is fun, that you can find what you want, you can get it easily. And so we did a bunch of, um, uh, let's see, hold on, how can I explain this? Um, so we did a beta test. I don't remember the exact details of the beta test, but in that beta test, we got a bunch of comments from users, from customers. And here they are. Yeah. Okay. And um, and Jeff, gave, Jeff, I read those comments. I read every single comment. Jeff read every single comment, and he gave back a lot of comments on like what he thought was important. And I think the point here is that you know, from the earliest days, we were really focused on the customers. Jeff was really focused on the customers. I was. Everyone was really focused on the customers. And I'm just trying to see where his notes are. Ugh, I do have them somewhere. Yeah, I think I remember you telling me, like, he emphasized, you know, that it didn't mean do exactly what they ask for, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's like, listen to what they're saying, what their problems are. You know, it's our job to feel their pain, but then be, use what we know about technology and what's possible to solve it. Something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think actually, like, if you were to ask me what's the big lesson that I take away from Amazon that you probably want to ask me about at the end. But I mean, to me, the big lesson is to listen to the customers, listen to them tell you what their problems are, and then sit quietly and really, really think about how we can use technology to solve those problems in a way that they can never even imagine. Right. So they're not going to tell you, I want one-click shopping. But they are going to tell you, wow, it is really tedious to go through this 12-page order form. Right. Right? And so that's where the innovation comes in. That's where the invention goes in, comes in. When you take listening to your customers' problems in their own voices yeah. and then n using what you know about technology to invent something they never would have even imagined. Yeah, because you can also imagine they're leaving feedback saying, I don't mind doing it once, but typing in all this information every single time, I always ship it to the same place. And at some points, some light bulb went off in somebody's head. And one click, I think it was Jeff's, but he's like, wait a second, we have all this. We should just make it a single click or two clicks, you know, or, or something like that to get it done. And that's, you know, as far as I remember from the stories, that's kind of what happened. And to the point where it was like a scary feature, right? Like the, the one click feature, like wasn't it pretty contentious uh, oh, even my internally? Do you want me to tell tell the one click? Yeah, definitely tell the one click story. It's a great story. Okay, so this this is a little bit later oh, on. Maybe give the background around one click, just because again, one click's gone from the website now. So you might just it's kind of self obvious, but maybe just to explain real right. quickly what, what it, it's just gone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so so we had this twelve page order form, and you know that was really tedious and. One day, and we all knew it was tedious, and we, we heard that customers were complaining about, about that. And then one day, Jeff comes down and he says, we need to have one-click ordering on the website. And we're like, what do you mean one-click ordering? And, you know, we need to just have a button where they, they just click it, and then the order just goes. Mm -hmm. So 
we were like, wow, that's really interesting. That's, that's new. That's different. And so we started to work on it. We started to design it. The engineers started to work on the technology to, to build it and all of this. But the story I want to tell about is what happens once we had done all the technical work and we had done the visual design and we had done the UI design. We said, let's go show it to some users. So we took it down to the warehouse and we showed this um, prototype to a bunch of people who were working in the warehouse. And they hated it. <laughs> they were so freaked out. They were like, what do you mean? I just click this button and, 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 and how did you get my credit card? And, and, and is this gonna come? What if I don't want this? What if I did it by mistake? I mean, they were right. really upset. And so I think it was Lori Bortscheller and I, she was another um, program manager. We went back to Jeff and we said, Jeff, you know, this, it's like, wow, people are really scared. One click is just too far. It's, we're going too far. What if we make it two click? Right. What if we make it like you click and then you confirm? We're like, yeah, that would be great. He's like, no, it has to be one click. So we just, we were like, oh my God, what are we going to do? How are we going to make this palatable to people? We love the, the boldness of it, but it has this problem. So we kind of went back to the drawing board. I can't remember who exactly came up with it, but we ended up coming up with this idea of putting a little tiny nine point font in parentheses under the button that says you can always, or you have 90 minutes to cancel. You have 30 minutes or 90 minutes to cancel your order. I think it's 90 minutes, you have 90 yeah. minutes to cancel. Um, just like under the shopping cart, we had tiny little font that said add to cart and then you can always change your mind later or something right. like that. So we added this tiny little reassuring text and then we went back and we showed it to a group of users again and they loved it. Right. So it was just, I just think it was, it's a great story because you're taking this combination of bold solution, use, you know, user problem, bold solution, then getting user feedback again, tweaking it just a little bit and then off you go. And it really was revolutionary for yeah, Amazon. And it goes from abhorrent to, you know, people are, you know, totally turned off by it to something like, oh yeah, this is great. I get it now. And it was really just a few words and the right placement. Yeah, just yeah. a few words with the right tone, with the right sensitivity to understanding what was going on emotionally for those users at that moment. Right. Um, yeah. And there's thousands of those over the years, but that one really sticks with people. I, I spoke with um, Jen Cast, who was our VP of mar first VP of marketing, and we'll be interviewing her about some other stuff. And this, she told the same story. So it like oh, really? really resonated. She was like, I remember engineers were really upset about this and Jeff just had a clear vision of what he wanted and he stuck to it. But at the same time, it's not like we shipped it the way it was when people hated it down in the warehouse. You know, we made tweaks to, based on the feedback that and the concerns people had. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So really trying to understand like what was the thing that was bothering them. We knew this was going to solve a big problem, but we also had to address their right emotional state at the moment. So that yeah. so one click launched with V3 and by the way I went back and found the press release and it's September of 97. What mm -hmm. I I think V3 also had instant Rex like and I think you had a story about David Risher. Yeah, so, you know. So the thing about V3 I know that you've talked about it a lot and a lot of people bring it up say what what's the big deal with V3? So I think really fundamentally um, one of the big deals about V3 version 3 was that it was one of the first times where we really packaged up a whole set of features into one release. Yeah. Where they released a date and we were gonna send out a press release about it. So before that, we had done a site redesign, you know, and, and made tweaks and changed features, things like when we wanted to, we'd roll them out when they were ready. But this was a release that was bundling these things all together. And um, some of the things that were in this version were one click. There was um, this thing we called Book Matcher, which was one of our early forays into doing recommendations for people. We had this idea of instant recs, which was instant recommendations that you could see right on the homepage. Um, we had our browse taxonomy, which was a big project that we did. We also added navigation at the very top, what we called chiclet navigation. It was little black boxes with little colorful kind of chiclets sticking out. Right across the top. And then also Kim Rackmeller, the technical program manager leads, Kim and I were kind of um, partners in everything we did. She was the technical program manager lead. I was, I think, I don't remember what my title was, but I was basically the program manager lead. 
on the non-technical side. And so Kim talked about how we did all these underlying hardware architecture changes at the same time going from single server to multiple servers. So we bundled all of these things together in this one release. And David Risher, who was, I think he was the VP of product development at that time. I have to say titles were just, at least to <laughs> me, just not a thing. I, I, I had so many different titles over the years at Amazon and I just really never yeah. paid attention to them. But. Um, but one of the things that he told me when we were putting together this package of features is that you've got to have at least one thing that you can talk about to the outside world that's yeah. going to get buzz, that people are going to want to talk about and tell their friends about. And so for us, that was one click and these instant recommendations. Because otherwise, you know, we would have talked about it. Oh, well, we're adding, you know... Um, navigation, navigation and browse. Yeah. We changed our underlying hardware architecture and you know the, the customers would be like, yeah, what is it doing for me, right? So Yeah, David always had a really good sense of like cuz instant recommendations is a really that's something people can gravitate to, especially reporters and they can experience it themselves and then gush about it in their stories, you know, and so right. instant, yeah. You know. Yeah. And Greg Linden is the engineer who really developed that and hopefully you'll be talking to him um, later to go into how he did that. But one of the principal things that I saw engineers do over and over again at Amazon, which was, I think, just so brilliant, was they would use customer behavioral data to make a better experience for the customers. And so that's one of the themes that really comes out for me from my early years at Amazon was that everybody was focused on the customer. Jeff was focused on the customer. I was focused on the customer. The designers, the engineers, the, the writers, everyone was focused on the customers. The engineers were thinking, how can I make this better for people? Right. Uh, with the Bottega boxes, they were thinking, how can we make search better? Oh, we can use user behavioral data to create better search results. Right. You know, oh, we can say people who bought this also bought that. That's going to help people find things that they, that they want to buy. So, yeah. And... After V3, was uh, we haven't talked about a post-mortem in any of the episodes yet. I don't know if V3 is a good one or if there's a different, uh, yeah. and maybe just tell people, tell listeners, again, maybe sounds self-explanatory, but in the technology world, post-mortems are more of a thing. Yeah, so um, Kim Rackmeller and I thought that after every major project, we should do a post-mortem which is sort of a depressing term because you think that it's something that you do after something dies when in fact we were doing it after something had been born, this new release. But we did these um, postmortems where we would get together everyone who had worked on the project in any way, shape, or form, and we would ask them these questions. What went well? What could be better? And so, let's see, where is that postmortem? So for, for V3 and V4, we did a postmortem and I think it's interesting. I, you know, I had all these things laid out just before we met, and now I can't find any of them. That's no right. problem. Okay, so here it is. So, so this, these were our conclusions, and I think this is interesting because it, it speaks to some of the things that were top of mind for the team. So this was the postmortem after V4. And what we said was, what was good in V3 and still good in V4? what was bad in V3 and better in V4, and what was bad in V3 and still bad in V4. <laughs> I will say that I think that we were all tried to be like very kind of self-critical and realistic and, and kind of own up to what was working and what wasn't working um, because we were all kind of obsessed with making things better all the time. Right. So in V4, these are things that were good in V3 and still good in V4. We launched. We had smooth inter interdepartmental work. We did user testing. We had weekly huddles and a war team. The project had clearly defined aims. We were flexible when necessary, but we maintained discipline, and we improved our liaison with customer service. Customer service, if I can just take a slight detour, yeah. customer service was such an important part of what we did. It was like customer service fed us information constantly about what was going on for our customers, what were their pain points, what were their delights, and we all worked in customer service. Yeah. We all worked in the queues, and we all answered customer service emails, which was an incredibly important way for us to be close to the customers and to understand how we could make things better for them. So I was gonna say, here's the things that were bad in V3 and better in V4. We got consistent, relevant mail lists. 
I don't even know what that means. <laughs> we had clear ownership of jobs and responsibilities in areas, which means that we didn't have that in V3, so we did have it in V4. We kept our work groups small. We brought customer service in even earlier. We cut features early. That speaks to another concept that I'm sure has been brought up, brutal triage. Yeah. Um, and we gave the project enough resources to get their jobs done on time. And then here were the things that were bad in V3 and still bad in V4. We did not do enough testing of internal and backend tools. We had inconsistent build schedules and communication failures, and we had technical problems with the builds. Yeah. So well, I think that gives a little, a little insight into how we were, the kinds of issues we were dealing with. I got there about you know, nine months after that memo was probably done, but the thing I remembered which was impressive, it, like on the feedback part, it was that we actually used it. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. you know, now 20 years have gone by or maybe more than that, which sadly. But like, I almost get like a rash when somebody says, let's do a customer survey. Because I have had so many experiences, not at Amazon, where we do this survey and it just never gets used or it's so complicated or whatever. And I always felt like um, you and your team just did a really good job of not just executing it well, but then incorporating it. But then the second part, and then I'll shut up, is, uh, is post-mortems. Because it's really, the post-mortem's not just about what went right and what went wrong, it's about how do we make the process better the next time so that we can, because this is going to keep on happening. We're not going <laughs> to, there's going to be more launches and more product releases and you know, sort of try to make the, the process or the mechanisms better. Yeah, I mean, those were really important because it, it would be easy to just launch and then go headlong into the next thing, um, especially when we were we felt we were under huge time pressure to do everything as fast as humanly possible. But taking the time to do those post mortems and to and and to do them broadly, you know, to have everyone who was involved in the project, right. um, like for example, one technique that we used in the post mortem on V five, which was the music launch, which was another really big launch for us. Okay, can I pause just to, let's just put a bow on V three and V four because V three was sort of in September. You can think of that. There's a lot of things there, but one click and instant wrecks. <laughs> like they were it was really big. And then V four, I think we snuck it out right before the holidays in ninety seven. It was, you know, and I I, I guess yes. the the big thing there was gift certificates, gift but you'll certificates. you'll probably tell me it was a few things. Yeah, so V4 was a holiday release. It combined gift certificates, a gift center. We added a new chiclet to the yeah. navigation gift center. Amazon Kids, um, those were the main things about, about V4. So it yeah. wasn't as big, a, uh, it didn't combine as many things as V3, but it gave us something to talk about in the run-up to the holidays, which was, of course, huge for us. Well, and also just to put in perspective for listeners, Gift certificates were really novel back then, and it was a way for us to sell things or quote unquote book revenue right up until literally hours before Christmas, because a person could come and buy a gift certificate and you know give it to someone. And so it was a, a way when we could no longer ship things on time. It was a really big uh, innovation, right? Yeah, it was a huge innovation for us to be able to say like even on Christmas Eve, there's still something that we could do for you. Right. And I think we, you know, we really had this kind of Santa Claus feeling like we, we were so committed to getting people their stuff for Christmas. I remember one customer service rep who literally took an order, put it in the back of their truck and drove, you know, hours to deliver this, this um, package to someone because it was for their kid on Christmas. Right. So, um, so we were, we were very obsessed with, I keep using the word obsession. I think yeah. this is a theme. We were very obsessed with, you know, trying to give people a good holiday experience. And and uh, I remember you mentioned that December of that year. I don't know what the exact date was, but we had our first big New Yorker cartoon, which was yeah, like, a, we've, a, we've arrived. That. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've always been a big New Yorker reader, and when I opened up the New Yorker, and there was this cartoon, um, it was actually very NPC. It showed two people in a bookstore in a, in a torrid, passionate embrace. And the, the one person saying to the other one as, as, you know, they're kind of ripping off their clothes, saying, this would never happen on Amazon.com. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, wow, we've arrived. We're in the New Yorker. We're like big time now. I will put that in the, uh, I'll put that on the, the, the podcast page for this one. It's great. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was really the kind of thing where, you know, I, I had moved from New York to Seattle, and every time I would go back to New York, the first time, you know, people would say, what are you doing out there on the West Coast? And I'd say, well, you know, there's this thing called the Internet. Have you heard of it? No, what's that? You know, and then I'd go back right. a few months later, and then I'd say, well, you know, I'm working at this this place. They're like, what are you doing out there in Seattle? There's this thing called an online bookstore. What's that? You know, and then each yeah. time I would go back, they would sort of know a little bit more until finally I would go back east and they would say, oh, yeah. I ordered from Amazon.com. Yeah. Yeah, it was really fun. It was a good cocktail party uh, conversation piece by the time I got there. Like, you're working at Amazon. That's awesome. I love it. Um, but you, you all were there before anybody sort of knew what it was or even what online shopping was. So Actually, uh, and I will, say, I will say one thing. When I was, when I interviewed with Amazon and I was, you know, had, you know, a week or two to think about the job offer, um, I went to all around Seattle to talk to other people doing kind of informational what else is going on in Seattle kind of chats. And I talked to VCs, I talked to, you know, different startup people, I talked to lots and lots of different people. Every single person I talked to said, don't join Amazon. Every single person. They thought it was nuts, they thought it was crazy. Right. Um, they thought it would never work. And so I just want to say to people out there, if, you know, I had a, I had a conviction based on my own experience and my also belief in Jeff that this was the right thing to do. And I just want to say to people out there, when you have that conviction, just like, don't, don't listen to what the naysayers say. Well, it's also the worst thing that, ha the worst thing that happens really is it fails, you know? Yeah. Um, and then and, and so what? Then you move on to the next thing. Yeah, I was going to say, like, my, my inspiration was I, was, I ran a bulletin board when I was in high school, you know, on my Apple II Plus with a modem, you know, like war games. And I just stopped using it until AOL happened. And sort of when I saw AOL, I'm like, oh, I know what that is. That's what we used to do. Yeah. So I didn't really right. need to be convinced about it. I, I was excited, but I was really in love with the bookstore and then, you know, everything else was, was gravy. So that this is a good, just for the listener, now in 35 minutes or so, we've gone from you arriving with that static page with black text on white background to now we have a much better looking uh, homepage with search, with recommendations, you know, with navigation that works and browse and competitive features. Let's and talk gift certificates and gift yeah. certificates and a holiday store. I mean, just think about how much that changed. And we also just today released Alex Edelman's uh, episode. Alex did the, and he was wrestling with HTML 1.0, you know, like really simple tool. So it's, you have to put it into context of why that was really difficult back then, you know, to, to get all of that done with the technology in the state it was. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, when we're talking about HTML 1.0, we're basically like writing every page by hand. Right. Right. Um, and, and just going from writing every page by hand to having templates was technology that we had to you know, develop, that our engineering team had to develop. And also, I will say that the speed at which we launched stuff was really incredible. Um, our, our kind of point of reference internally was Microsoft that was on the other side of the lake in Seattle. And, you know, looking at how long did it take to release something there. And we were releasing things in a matter of, you know, a couple months. Um, whereas, like, other kinds of software would take, you know, quite a bit longer to release. Yeah. Um, but there's something about it that feels kind of like dog years. It's like, you know, oh, it was a couple months, but it felt like, it felt like seven years. <laughs> yeah, know? well, it was, really, it was really compressed, but I actually got an email today from Greg Linden, and he talked about, like, are loving the four- to eight-week release cycles because they're so much faster, but the truth is they're not perfect when they go out. They're feature poor versus Microsoft had to put these feature-rich things. You know, they would put every bell and whistle in there, but they'd only release it every 18 months or so. And so by going out with like minimum viable feature releases and seeing if it works and then iterating on it, it was, uh, again, it was something you could do with the, it's where you started the interview, something you could do with internet software that you couldn't as easily do with CD-ROMs and, and that sort right. of thing. Right, so and that was, the, that was the beauty of it because you could, you could put the thing out, you could do that brutal triage, you could get the thing in front of customers, and then as the customers told you, what was working, what wasn't working, where the pain points were, you could put your effort into the things that mattered, not the things that didn't matter. Right. So that was beautiful. So this is a perfect transition then to V5. So V5 came, in, and actually it came the week I started, I think in May 98. Oh, really? I think I was so, uh, so oblivious, I had no idea we had a big launch that week. But uh, <laughs> talk about what was in V5 and what was different about how we did it. 
Right, so V5 was a very big deal because it was the first time that we were going to sell something other than books. So we were going from just selling books to selling books and music. Right. And I remember actually at the company offsite earlier that year, Jeff made a mind-blowing announcement to all of us where he said, um, our, our mission is to be the world's most authoritative seller of information-based products. And all of us, you know, our minds were blown, yeah. right? Oh my God, we're gonna sell more than books? How is this possible? Um, but it, it was information-based products, so that would be books, music, and video. Um, at that point, at least internally, publicly within the company, there right. wasn't a contemplation yet of toys, consumer electronics, tools, and everything that came after. So this was our first um, splitting of the software, the database, the interface, everything into these two products. And so it was a really foundational piece, and we knew we were going to go be going to video after that. And so um, it was foundational to do that split, right? Like there was a million things in the code that referenced books. There were, you know, dimensions of, of images that were the, the dimensions of book covers, not album covers. Um, there was, you know, our, our systems were based on ISBNs. There was all kinds of things that were book specific. And so this, this, this bifurcation yeah. was really important. Now, something that was, um, there were two, two things I'd love to talk about with V5. One is how we did our mini launch and the other is the tabs navigation. Awesome. So the mini launch, we called, we, we were very, I mean, it was scary to do this launch. There were so many things that could go wrong. And so Kim Rackmeller, who was the technical program manager, and Jennifer Cast, who was the um, GM of the music launch, the kind of business side of that, we were kind of figuring out like, how do we de-risk this situation? And one of the ideas that we came up with was to do a mini launch to a small subset of users. And we had never done that before. Right. And so we were like, well, what are we going to do? Well, how are we going to, um, you know, what's it going to look like if there's bugs and there's problems and, and, and this could be really bad, and, but we need to de-risk it. So we were trying to juggle all these things. And so what we decided was to call this mini launch Build the Store. And so we really enlisted our, our customers in the process and made them partners with us in building the store and right. giving right. us feedback about like what was working, what wasn't working, what did they like, what didn't they like. And so again, this is us like we did from the first day, getting user feedback and incorporating that into the development process. Do you remember some of the big things that came from that customer feedback or, or, or was a big part of this just buying ourselves some time to, go, uh, to get everything ready? Well, let's see. Hold and on. also, was it password protected? Was it a unique URL? Like, how did did everybody have the same password? Did they have unique passwords? Like, when you, I, I don't remember any of this. So, like I said, Let it launched four it. days before I got there. Look at this. Hold on. I have. Okay. Okay. This is this is what we said about build the store. We said help Amazon.com build the best music store on the net. We called it the net. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> the best music store on the net. While searching for and buying CDs, customers will be able to provide customer reviews, suggestions, information about music preferences, interests, interests, etc. Um, so then we have, have a bunch of stuff about how we were explaining it to people. Um, let's see. Oh, and then we were giving people rewards for um, giving us ideas about how to improve the music store. So we said the best idea of the week will win a CD. There'll be a random selection to win a trip to see a concert in New York or LA. And we also had some music paraphernalia prizes like Jimi Hendrix's guitar. I don't know, I don't know if we actually had that, but right. those were our ideas. So um, we sent emails to customers who had previously bought music for us from us. We did have some music titles in our catalog, but they right. were just mixed in with everything else. So we sent emails to the customers who had previously bought music from us to expressly invite them to help us build the store. Um, and we also told people about it by a packing slip blurb in the orders that we were shipping out, right. inviting them to the URL to help us build the store. And that, so was, at the time, that was at the time where somebody could just print off 5,000 inserts and go down there and stand there and put them in boxes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
So um, let me just see if I have anything else interesting about that. Um, well, yeah, do you remember any specific feedback that somebody came back with that was like a eureka moment? Like, oh my God, I can't believe we didn't think of that. Or did it help us deprioritize some things that really we were trying to get in but didn't seem to be a big problem? Well, I don't know whether we had decided it before the mini launch or not, but you you probably remember that like we had to decide that classical music was not going to go out with the launch. Yeah. But yeah, that's, Kim, a pretty, that's a pretty big decision, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, but I, do, I will show you, this is the customer feedback that we got. Yeah. I'm showing you here a picture of this printed out from um, the kinds of things that people were saying. And we read every single piece of feedback. And I don't have the, like, um, the, you know, how, how we categorize that feedback and what we did with it, but we absolutely used it. <laughs> right, so, so we, and I had the date. So external beta was May 14th of 98. But then launch was supposed to be May 26th, only 12 days later, but it actually went live we in, in, in June. June. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I also wanted to show you one thing about, um, about that launch and the launch dates. You know, we were developing at the same time that we were developing the website and that we were developing the technology and that we were developing the customer experience, we were also developing the processes about how to launch things. Right. And so um, the idea of, coming up with dates and estimating how long it was going to take and committing to things so that we could have an external launch of the build the store and then the press press um, launches. That was all kind of new. And so Kim and I tried to get all of us to really commit to those dates. And we didn't have any real software to do it, but we had our meeting maker software <laughs> where we would print it out and we would write down in pen what the different milestones were on the calendar and hand it out to everybody. And then we had people sign and actually sign in blood. Like, <laughs> this is actual blood on this piece of paper of us signing our calendar for our launch date. That's so funny. I see, well, I see Susan Benson and Kim Rockmiller. I may have seen a Jeff Holden. I'm not sure if he was there at the time, but uh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I won't ask about where how the blood was uh, was was uh, collected, but that's pretty. Yeah, I think there was some finger pricks and some then thumbprints and that kind of thing going on. But that just like shows the kind of. So and that's awesome. So tell me, there was so basically the big thing was not just the external beta and getting it out, but we also kind of knew that we had other products coming later in the year, which was video. And we don't have to get into the video DVD and holiday store sort of happened right before the end of the year, but. As part of E5, uh, that's when we introduced tabs for the first time, right? And maybe ex explain the difference between tabs and chiclets and why it was sort of a, a big deal. Oh, look at those cute tabs. Yeah, so, so, you know, we had a lot of conversations about what kind of navigation we were going to use for this new multi-product store that we were building. Before, the navigation that was at the top was, as you can imagine, book-centric. So, let's see, we had... Um, where is it over here? We had, you know, search, browse subjects, bestsellers, recommendation center, gift center, award winner, reviewed in the media, and shopping cart. Those were the things across the top in our, in our navigation. But now what were we going to do? We were going to have browse subjects, and then that was going to go to a book browse and a music browse. Right. Bestsellers was going to go to book bestsellers, music bestsellers. How is this going to work? Even the concept of this is going to be a separate store and right. you're going to choose at the top level between books and music. That was an idea that we had to come up with. And then once that we kind of settled on that idea, then there was the question of how, what was that going to look like? How right. were users going to understand that? And so um, there, it was actually really controversial, and there was a lot of battling over this navigation. And there were some really beautiful designs that were created that were, that were really visually appealing. Um, but very difficult to execute in HTML 1.0, right. kind of um, impossible, and and also not necessarily super super crystal clear to users. And so I think it was Josh Peterson who came up with this idea of using a file folder metaphor. From I'm not sure where he got it. I think he was probably just looking at his right. file cabinet um, and using this file metaphor. Um, as the navigation, and that's sort of how we came up with this idea of having a books tab and a music tab, and then thought, okay, 
you can, we can then expand this to video and maybe a couple of other things. Now, of course, at that time, we didn't realize how many, many other things we were going to do. And right. the tab, you know, um, ran up against the limits of the screen size. But Yeah, at but some point, we, we had like two or three uh, levels of tabs. It was totally absurd. And there were parodies of it uh, outside the company. But um, yes. But it is, I mean, for entrepreneurs, like this, these are very, very common problems when you venture out of your first category and suddenly you realize everything changes. You know, like you're, when you're searching for the partner, what are search results going to be? Like it has to be music and video somehow. And it, what seems simple gets really complicated quickly because there are unexpected word combinations that, you know, conflict across the catalog. So it was lots of, lots of complications. It was, it was definitely. And you can see by that time, you know, then we had our keyword search and then you could choose with radio buttons, books or music, full search, books or music. We had to create that bifurcation like all yeah. the way through the experience and then bring it back together again in the shopping cart. Yeah. Well, yeah, very complicated. And, and we're, at, we're at about 50 minutes, so we're going to have to start to wrap. But like maybe mention, so V6 then, so wrapping out 1998, right. V6. So V6 was video and a holiday gift center. And I think the things that, to me, I mean, you can have more in-depth conversations with Jason Kylar, who is the GM of the video store, and Eugene Way, who I'm sure has a lot of really articulate things to say about it. Um, but two of the things that, that stand out for me was that V6 took a lot less time to do than V5, mm -hmm. right? So doing some of that work to think about contemplate multiple categories. Um, and then it really kind of sunk into, for me at least, that, wow, we're going to have to get really good at doing this over and over again and doing it fast and making it more decentralized. Um, yeah. Because we were always struggling with bottlenecks, bottlenecks. And, you know, how are we going to decentralize and let these different product teams um, for music, for video, for then it became toys, electronics, tools. How are we going to let them operate independently? And that um, that that tension between centralization and decentralization, and moving fast and keeping things consistent, um, really was was a dialectic that we kind of um, went back and forth uh, between those poles over the over the next couple of years. So in in different ways, both in our organizational structure. Like, were we going to have site development? Were all the web developers going to be in one group? Were they going to be right. each, to each product line was going to have its own group? You know, what, what did that mean for collegiality among people who shared a skill set versus um, uh, tight functioning and being close to the customer in a product line? It also um, led to questions about design and, and U, U, UI and UX. You know, how do we, we had, we tried to create I have some documentation where Helen Owens, the design director, and Josh Peterson and I were working on design principles that could be used in a decentralized manner so that our org chart wouldn't show on our website. Right. You know, because the customers wouldn't want things to work differently in the video store from in the bookstore. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it's so like it overarching principles of like it has to fit within this. Because I, I remember even back then, every store would kind of have to pick a color. Because the nav, you know, would change for that store, and um, yeah, it was, again, it's very, it's common problems like that centralized, decentralized things. As people, as companies grow, I was at a board meeting last uh, Thursday, and we were talking. I'm like, this is deja vu because we're talking about the same thing from 25 years ago, but in a you really? know a new, a new context. So, um, so yeah, so so stepping back, uh, can I say well, two more things before oh, we step back? Of course, yeah. Sorry. Um, about those design standards, you know, we were we were talking about colors, browser compatibility, fonts, headings, um, you know, services that needed to work across all products. Like, for example, um, let's see, for example, oh, we, we were talking about um, uh, tone, voice, um, things that had to work across all things, like log on, passwords. Um, right. You know, all of these different kinds of things that we had to specify, where could things be unique and different in a product line and where did they need to work across across the board? And then also yeah. I just, the other thing I wanted to mention was I did finally find this um, document with all of Jeff's comments on the early feedback that we got. And he was talking about things like, um, we really want the site to be fun. And he's saying that, you know, we wanna make sure to get email addresses because what, we collected phone numbers then 
Right. And so, you know, and email. So like we need to collect the emails and the phone numbers because if the email bounces, we need a way to c- contact the customer if we have a problem with their order, you know. Right. So, yeah. And that's a that, lot of, that, kind of attention, massive attention to detail. Yeah, that compl- it's funny how uh, the email problem has still never gone away. <laughs> We're still, <laughs> still wrestling with changing emails. So when you step back from all the detail, like what do you, and you've, you've said some of this already, but what do you think about the macro topics applying to sort of site development? Really, you own user experience. I mean, I know everybody owned it and that's one thing, but like your team's owned getting that user experience right. And from the beginning of this talk, it was about making the website interactive, you know, and so what do you take as the sort of takeaways that you probably talk with entrepreneurs about all the time? I think one of the things that I talk, I do talk to entrepreneurs about, and actually I still do in my work is, as I said before, really going out and, and listening to customers in their own voices, in their own words, to see that they write into customer service in all caps because they're that upset, right. you know, to um, he feel the urgency of the pain that they're feeling about something and then to work in a multidisciplinary way with engineering, with design, with writing to come up with these innovative solutions. To me, that's the big takeaway about everything that we that we did was trying to innovate on the behalf of customers. And I think that, you know, that's one theme. And the other theme is that is that sense of of ownership, you know, mm-hmm. signing in blood on our schedules. Like that's because like we for whatever reason, we all really, really cared about getting it right. Yeah. We cared about things like typos on the website. We cared about, you know, was it going to take people longer to do this? Are we, we going to be saving them time? I think that the, the people I worked with at Amazon were not only incredibly smart and hardworking, but, you know, and we have a reputation of having like a, a, a kind of hard edge culture. But I think it was really in the service of delivering for people and making their, their lives better. And yeah. feeling ownership that like no one's no one sat around to wait for someone to tell them to do something. Yeah, and I also think about like there was a l- tremendous sense of pride in in innovation. You know, like listening to the customer but then coming up with a solution that the probably customer couldn't have anticipated. Like the work that Greg Linden who mentioned and uh, and the personalization team and search oh, yeah. teams like all these things it was kind of magic, you know, and uh, back then and so it's one thing to listen, but then there's the, the part where you got to take that and turn it into something magical that gets people excited. Yeah, and that's, and that's the real trick. And I, I mean, I do think that, it, you know, Jeff, Jeff Bezos set a great example of boldness. You know, he just really, he was just really unafraid about a lot of things. Yeah. Well, that got us to 1998. We have four more years. So I, I hope you will uh, consider coming back in a few weeks and... Um, and we do some some future launches. It's really, th- I'll just say thank you so much for you know being my guest uh, on on the podcast. It's been my pleasure. I really, I, I I have three wonderful children. I feel like in a lot of ways, I used to say Amazon was my first child. Right. It really felt like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's so funny too because I mean I visibly remember your office in the corner there on, in on, in the Columbia Building, and you know everybody was sort of around that corner with David Risher there and Andy and Jason, and so I think people are going to love hearing these stories. Like they really are equally applicable to an experience on Airbnb today, or you know, or next door where you work now. I, for yeah, the record, I, I for, for the record, I sent Miriam feedback about next door a couple days ago. <laughs> I'm like, this is unacceptable. I can't believe this works this way. And I knew she would pass it right on to the product team. So absolutely, and absolutely, and actually, you know, in my work at Next Door, I do I do user research and I talk to users all day long, and I love it. Yeah. Well, yeah, like I said, I, I, I think the stories about how your team actually, actually use customer feedback and actually iterate and, and then follow that all the way through to the postmortems was a really big reason over that multi-year period that we really did not just iterate and innovate so quickly, but that we improved the processes, maybe the boring behind the scene processes to, to make it repeatable. So I think every startup can learn a ton from that. Um, and as usual, it was great to see you. Um, it's been too. too long. So uh, for the audience, 
thank you for listening to the Invent Like an Owner podcast. If you'd like more details about what we discussed today, and by the way, Miriam, I want to get copies of all that stuff or screenshots or whatever. Uh, I think Absolutely. it'll be great on the post. Um, you know, so or if you want, you have edits or suggestions for topics, please uh, reach out. Uh, visit inventlikeanowner.com to sign up for the weekly newsletter. Uh, and that's it for today. And remember, no sniveling.